All right, welcome back. So this is chapter five of industrial organization. And uh, this chapter is all about perfect competition. So you've probably seen perfect competition in principles of micro, and you've probably seen perfect competition in intermediate micro if you've had it. And you may have wondered, why are we spending so much time talking about perfect competition? Right, because perfect competition, you know, outside of maybe some commodity markets, is really not a great representation of reality. Certainly, it's not a great representation of, you know, the complex consumer markets um, that we're all familiar with. And so, I think there is a reason that we focus on perfect competition. Perfect competition really provides us with a comparison point, right? So we can say. All right, well, we can prove some things about perfect competition. We can say that, you know, it's um, Pareto efficient. We can say, you know, maximizes total surplus. Really, these are the same things. Um, and it's also sort of the minimum price, right, where uh, that consumers are going to face. And so while it's not a realistic model of most economic markets, uh, it does allow us to sort of compare you know, well, how close are we to perfect competition in this market? So, you know, if we have a markup of 100% compared to marginal cost, we know we're pretty far away from perfect competition. Whereas if we have a markup of, you know, 5% or 10%, we're a lot closer. There's much less deadweight loss. And so we don't have to worry about that market as much. Um, and so, you know, we're going to talk about perfect competition. We will also talk about uh, monopoly and oligopoly. Uh, as we move through the semester, um, and perhaps a most realistic model of monopolistic competition, right? And I think one of the things to sort of keep in mind when we are discussing, you know, any markets is that, you know, the, the policy that is pro-market and the policy that is pro-business are not really going to be the same. And I think perfect competition really helps illustrate that point, right? Because if our if our policies are trying to move us towards perfect competition, because that gives us, you know, the lowest prices, the most uh, surplus, um, what is kind of keeping us from that? And really, the answer is that business strategies are trying to keep us from that and have been ever since, you know, the capitalist revolution really got going in the 19th century. So let's talk about what our assumptions for perfect competition are. First, we're going to keep this assumption, the first assumption, sort of throughout the semester that firms are profit maximizers. Now, there is some literature out there about other things that firms might want to maximize, right? They might want to maximize size, especially because CEO tend, pay tends to be uh, most correlated with firm size. Um, they might want to maximize, you know, market share. They might want to maximize a lot of things. But for the most part, we assume that firms are profit maximizers. The second one is probably true in a lot of commodity markets, but not true in most uh, other markets, which is that firms produce perfectly homogeneous goods, meaning that all the goods are exactly the same. So you can't tell the difference between, you know, a, a good from this firm and a good from that firm. Now, if we're talking about, you know, iron ore or corn or soybeans, then, OK, yeah, that's probably true. Um, but for a lot of consumer products, of course, that's going to be very, very much not true. Um, we are also going to assume that there are many firms. I mean, this says many identical firms. I mean, that's probably true, right? Because uh, we need them to have the same cost structure, basically. Um, and it's important that there are many firms because we are going to, you know, assume that no, no firm has any pricing power. Now, that's definitely something that we're going to relax later in the semester. Um, <clears throat> but if you think about like sort of late 19th century capitalism, right, where we had a lot of these uh, homogeneous goods, these commodity markets, oil and steel and uh, things like that, what happened was firms realized that perfect competition was really bad for their profit line. And so they started to get bigger and bigger and bigger and build up these trusts. And that's really where our first antitrust um, policies came from, which we'll talk about a little bit later this semester. Uh, we're also assuming there are no barriers to entry or exit. This is going to be important, right? Because when profits are low or negative, we expect firms to exit. When profits are high, we expect firms to enter. Um, and if there are high costs to either of those, then that's going to throw in some frictions into our market and we won't get to 
our sort of perfectly competitive equilibrium. And then finally, five, there are no frictions or other forms of market imperfections. And so this is going to be important for, you know, saying that there's, you know, there's no vertical integrations, uh, there's no information asymmetries, there's no externalities, um, because any of those things can throw off our, our equilibrium in perfect competition. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about all of these a little bit more and definitely we'll be relaxing these assumptions uh, throughout the semester as we look at different types of markets. Now, as I said, right, firms hate perfect competition because what do we get in perfect competition? We get zero economic profits, right? Meaning that our accounting profits, just revenue minus costs, are going to be the same sort of across industries. And so the closer we get to perfect competition, the lower go profits. And so firms really don't want to be in perfect competition. Uh, competition is fierce, right? You're basically, you know, competing um, so that price gets down to marginal cost. Uh, and so firms will do what they can to get out of perfect competition, right? So they will differentiate their products, even if they're not really differentiated. They will advertise, right? So try to build market share through whether it's, you know, the availability heuristic, the affect heuristic, um, whatever it is, and they will merge, right? And so this is what I was talking about before is, you know, this is really what happened in the 19th century is firms just got bigger and bigger because they realized the bigger they were, the more market share they had, the more pricing power they had. And, of course, there were no laws against that in uh, the 19th century until the Sherman Antitrust Act uh, in the United States. So they could get bigger and bigger and increase their profits. And that's why, you know, we think of these, you know, titans of industry as both, you know, robber barons and, you know, captains of industry. So really, they're, they're doing the same thing there. All right. So let's think about uh, how we sort of model perfect competition, right? So we have some market equilibrium price, which we'll call P star, and we're going to have an industry supply curve and a market demand curve. Now, as with all well-behaved demand curves, it will be downward sloping, meaning that people will buy more when the price is lower and they will buy less when the price is higher. But because all firms are small and because all products are the same, firms don't have a downward sloping demand curve right? They can only sell at that market price. If they try to increase their price, then they won't sell anything. And if they try to decrease their price, they'll really just sell however much they can produce anyway, and they'll be losing money, so they'll go out of business. And so firms only have that horizontal demand curve, which we'll see in a second. And that's going to be equal to the marginal uh, revenue, which is equal to the price. Now, as we'll talk about when we talk about monopoly, right? Usually in a, in a monopoly where a firm is facing a downward sloping demand curve, marginal revenue is also downward sloping, but that's not the case here, right? Marginal revenue is just flat and equal to the market price. And since we have so many firms and since the firms are small, then no one firm's production decisions are big enough to change that price. And so you just, a firm is not choosing uh, price along a downward sloping demand curve in order to maximize um, profits, it's choosing quantity. And so the quantity that it chooses is going to depend on uh, its cost function. So here we have our sort of standard uh, market supply and demand curves, right? So we have our downward sloping market demand curve, our upward sloping market supply curve, where they meet, where quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded. Uh, is our perfectly competitive equilibrium, right? So we note that as P star and Q star. But from a firm's perspective, which is really the perspective we're going to be taking most of this uh, semester, they just have a horizontal demand curve at P star. They can sell as much or as little as they want um, at that price, P star. So if we think about total revenue, right? Total revenue then is just price times quantity. And so you can see, you know, in this case with a price equal to $2, total revenue is just 2 times Q. That's just an upward sloping uh, line with a slope equal to 2. And so 
that's going to be our revenue function. In order to maximize profit, of course, we need both revenue and costs. Um, so first, before we get to cost, let's think about marginal revenue um, and average revenue, right? So both of these are going to be important in going forward. And perfect competition is going to be a little bit different than everything else, right? Because here, marginal revenue and average revenue are going to be the same. So if we think about what marginal revenue is, right? Remember, marginal revenue is just the change in revenue from selling one more unit. So this um, nomenclature here just says it's the partial derivative of total revenue with respect to quantity. That just means how much does total revenue change when quantity changes a little bit. Now, in calculus, right, a little bit is very, very little. In the real life, right, of a firm, the change in quantity has to be one. And so you can just think about how much does total revenue change when we sell one more unit? Well, it changes by the price, right? And in this case, the price is just equal to the market price or P star. Now, average revenue is easier, right? We don't need any partial derivatives or anything. So it's just total revenue divided by quantity. Total revenue, we already said, was price times quantity divided by quantity. Well, that's just going to be uh, price or P star. And so in this case, right, marginal revenue and average revenue are just both equal to uh, P star or our, our market price. All right, so now let's think about uh, profit. So profit, which we're going to call pi here, right? So pi, um, pi gets a little overused in, in economics, usually in microeconomics like this class, pi means profit. Um, if you've taken a macroeconomics class, you may have seen pi used as inflation. Um, so this is profit. And profit is just equal to total revenue minus total cost, right? And so what we're going to do is choose our quantity such that marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And let's just think about that for a minute. So marginal revenue is how much revenue goes up from producing one unit. Marginal cost is how much cost goes up by producing one unit. If marginal revenue is higher than marginal cost, then producing that extra unit increases profit, right? You got more revenue from that last unit than cost. And so you should produce. And you should keep producing until that marginal revenue from producing another unit is just equal to that cost. And that's exactly what is going on um, here in our profit function. Now, so here our marginal cost is equal to 2Q. Um, and we can say, all right, well, so our marginal revenue is higher, higher, higher. It's getting closer, closer. And right here, they're equal. Now, if we keep producing, right, we're at the top of the hill here. If we keep producing, now we're still profitable, but our, our profit's going down, right? This is the maximum profit that we can have. And then this point here, right, is where profit is zero and then profit just keeps going down. So in this case, what we're trying to do is we're differentiating the profit function with respect to Q. And that's just is going to take the differentiation of total revenue with respect to Q, which by definition is marginal revenue. And the differentiation of total cost with respect to Q, which again, by definition, is marginal cost. And so then we have marginal revenue equals marginal cost equals zero. So why do we set it equal to zero? Well, remember that all differentiations are slopes, right? And so here's our profit function. The slope is positive, 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 but getting flatter. And right here at the top, the slope is zero. And so we're setting our differentiation equal to zero because we want to find that place right at the top. And so in this case, marginal revenue equals 2. Marginal cost equals 2Q. So 2 minus 2Q equals 0. We set, okay, we move the 2Q over to the other side. We get 2 equals 2Q. We divide by 2. Q star equals 1. And so in this case, our profit maximization says we should produce 1. And Maybe that's one unit, maybe that's 1,000 units, maybe it's 1 million units, but whatever it is, it's one. And so that's where we want to produce. If we're producing less than one, we're leaving profits on the table. If we're producing more than one, 
then our costs, our marginal costs are higher than our marginal revenue, so our profit's going down. We want to produce just one. All right, so we'll stop there for this video, and then we're going to go through perfect competition a little bit more and just look at a few more things that we can do with it, and we'll keep coming back to it as a reference point, as I said in the beginning, uh, in order to figure out um, you know, where we are in things like monopoly, oligopoly, uh, monopolistic competition in comparison to perfect competition.